Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Cinema A to B. Alec, today we're going to discuss, I know this is one of your favorites. This is uh, 2001's Ocean's Eleven, the Steven Soderbergh remake of the the old uh, Rat Pack movie. So why don't you kick us off on this? So you are absolutely correct. This movie is in my top five and has been in my top five for the longest time. I absolutely adore this movie, love this movie. It again, it's one of my favorite movies. It's usually in the three to five spot. It like fluctuates from year to year. I didn't get to see this movie in the theater. It was very, very sad because, but this is really one of my, yeah, I didn't oh, get to see no. the theater. I only saw it on, on home oh, video, no. but I know I'm very like, I didn't, didn't know that I was going to love it so much. And so like, I just didn't focus on it. And I never knew there was a lot. I never knew this. There's a lot of other stuff going on in my life. And so I didn't get to the movies that much, but at that time, but I will say it was, I, I don't remember exactly what number it was, but I had recently gotten a, a PlayStation to play DVDs. And this is one of the first DVDs I ever bought was oceans 11. And I will tell you, I have watched this movie so many times. I've watched all the behind the scenes features. I've watched all the commentaries. I adore this film. This is the type of movie you should remake. The Rat Pack Ocean's Eleven didn't do great. It was not bad, but it wasn't a fantastic film. So you didn't have a lot of nostalgia, a lot of people going like, oh, why are they remaking it? The Rat Pack is my real Ocean's Eleven because nobody cared. Like, whatever. And that's what we should be remaking. Taking these great idea movies. And I know I've said this before on this podcast, but we're talking about the movie that really cements this for me. Is take these old movies that have good ideas, update them, make them better, and then put them out and remake them. Because then you don't have to worry about nostalgia. Then you don't have to worry about the people saying the old one was better comparing it. Because no one cares about the old one. Most people didn't even know that it was a remake because... No one's watching the the old 1960 Rat Pack version with Frank Sinatra. I mean, and granted, it's very different because the only thing that's really the same is the only character that's the same is Daniel Ocean. The rest of them are all, all different. It's a heist movie with Daniel Ocean. That's really the basics of it. And, I, and it happens in Vegas. So to me, this is a perfect movie. There is no fat on this movie. Everything is done so well. Soderbergh absolutely, I'm not going to say over-directed it, but like, he knew what he was making. He knew what he wanted to make. I mean, he, cause he both directed, produced, and he also DP would this movie. So like he knew what he wanted in, in this movie and you can feel it to me. There is nothing that he did wrong. There's so much that he did right there. It, every time I watch it, I'm enthralled and I watch the whole thing through. Like I don't have, I I've never really just started this movie and then been like, ah, I don't want to finish it. Like the moment I see this movie, kind of like with you and Shawshank, I'm going to sit down and watch the rest of it. Like I'm just going to, complete it it because it it just moves so fast but it's done so well i mean we're talking like in the first four minutes he's already starting he's already talking about the heist like that's like that's the intro like yes you have nothing by 12 minutes in the actual planning of the heist is there so like you you find out about it and eight minutes later you're you're planning the heist i mean so like it there's not a lot of downtime a lot of like sitting around it is just like people, people call this movie a ride and some people don't like that, but that's totally what it is. You just, you just get in your seat, watch it and you just move along with it. I mean, Laura said when she saw it in the theater, like that's what she felt. She just felt like I just got pulled along. Like I didn't have to do any work. I just got pulled along on this film. My heart breaks for you a little bit that you didn't get to watch yeah. this in a movie theater. Cause I, I do remember the theatrical experience was wonderful. It was it was funny. It was exhilarating. the t- The twist ending. This is vintage Soderbergh. This, along with uh, what Traffic, he tried to duplicate it again with the sequels and just couldn't quite get there. And it's very much a lightning in a bottle movie. Just yeah. the. I still don't understand probably quite how he was able to assemble this cast. It's crazy. It's crazy. We talked, we've talked about other movies with really deep cast, but this one's like how many A-listers in this, you know, a minimum of like four or five. So you have Brad Pitt at his peak 
Like, like honestly speaking, in 2001, he, he's done Meet Joe Black. He's done Seven Years in Tibet. He's done 12 Monkeys. He's done Fight Club. He's done Thelma and Louise. I mean, he's done Legends in the Fall. I mean, he's done Interview with a Vampire at this point. Like, this is peak Brad Pitt. This is peak George Clooney as well. Like, he has gotten out and and is being – this is peak Julia Roberts. Like, Matt Damon is on also on the rise. I mean, I wouldn't say it's peak Matt Damon. This is before – Born Identity before he really blows up. But I mean, he's done Goodwill Hunting. He's done Rounders. He's done um, well, Talented Mr. Ripley. So like he's not the star that he is now, but he's definitely there. So reading about it, the salary actually all took pay cuts yeah. to do this film. You have to. For Soderbergh. You have to but, yeah, you have to. Like, um, so Soderbergh got Clooney on board first and then Clooney – talked with Julie Roberts, kind of talked with Brad Pitt, kind of got these people on. Now, some people like Matt Damon's character was actually supposed to be someone different. Um, I believe it was supposed to be Mark Wahlberg, I believe, hmm. was spo- actually reached out to first. And th- yeah. And then um, for Casey Affleck and Scott Kahn's roles, it was actually supposed to go to Luke and Owen Wilson. Oh, um, OK. But, that makes that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. But they but they ended up doing. Uh, Royal Tenenbaums instead, which I mean, you can't fault him for when, that. It's a great movie. Well, uh, yeah, it is a great movie. And when Wes Anderson basically has kind of strung you along and puts you in many things, like you say yes. No, to that's, that was a good. Kind of that was a good decision on their part because yeah, they're well, and, they're heavily featured in that movie. It's not like bit parts at yeah. all. So no, well, and it was about the same amount of screen time as what Casey Affleck and Scott Con got. And as much as I like Luke and Owen, I I, I can't I like. At this point, their, their Casey banter Affleck is and Scott so Connor, funny. So, it's so good. It's so good. Yeah. And so much of that is improv too. Yeah. They're just like, hey, just just go talk about it. So, I mean, this cast is so deep. Elliot Gould, Andy Garcia, you know, Carl Reiner is in this freaking movie. Mm-hmm. And just like, yeah. it all works so well. It is. You talk about like, quotable. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my and the problem is there's so many quotable things in this. And I quote it all the time. This is probably like next to Tommy boy. This is probably my most quoted film. Like I, I all the times that I'm like, I'm saying things trying to like when I'm ever, I'm playing poker or whatever, or any kind of jokes, I'm always doing the all reds, you know, when he puts <laughs> yeah. down his diamonds and, yeah. and hearts and I'm like, like, but nobody gets it, but it just makes me laugh. Yeah. Cause, oh man. I love and we go it. and we, we go way back. The guy with yeah, the place in the thing. <laughs> the guy with, uh, I'll uh, never yeah, forget I got some it. remaining furniture. Yeah. <laughs> I've never been to, to Belize. Yeah. You know, like oh, it's yeah. just all this it's, stuff. Oh. Yeah. Gould gets some great lines and. Oh, he does. Fortunately, I, I knew who Gould was when I saw this. Cause right around that time, it's my from, dad had had me watch uh, a bridge too far, which he's in quite a bit of the back half of, I believe. Mm. Cause he's a tank commander in that is uh, I don't, he's, I don't know. He's got a cigar in his mouth in that one too. <laughs> <laughs> well, he asked to put a cigar in this yeah. one. He's just like, let's, let's have him yeah. smoke a cigar. But, I, like, but thinking about brilliant. the cast and where everybody was at in their careers, I have to think that Julia Roberts would have been the biggest star in this when it was made and followed yeah. probably by um, Pitt. Clooney had come off yeah. of a good two film run with Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? And... What's the other one? Out of Sight at this point? Uh, Out of Sight wasn't that great a movie, but he had done Oh Brother and then Three three Kings. Three Kings. Oh, yeah, with Three Kings. So he had done Three Kings and this. And so I felt like this is the movie that solidified him as an Mm A-lister, which is impressive given how bad, you know, Batman and Robin was. Like Mm -hmm. his career was on an upward trajectory and he gets he gets cast Batman, which you think is going to be a good thing for your career. And they Except make that stinker and he, God bless him. He fell on the sword for that. And he really didn't have to, um, his performance is the least problematic thing in that movie. I think he was mm-hmm. miscast. I don't think he should have played Batman or Bruce Wayne, but that movie was just yeah. trash. Like there's no, yeah, there's no saving that. So yeah, he gets that good three film run and this is like the third one. Mm-hmm. And this, after this, he's just solidified as a, as a bona fide a lister after that. Cause then he continues to do good movies and not a bunch of stinkers anymore. And then you're, you're right. Pitt was just, Pitt's been on the top, top of the game. mountain forever now. I mean, that guy yeah. just, okay. We like people just think he's a pretty face. He is a phenomenal actor. He is 
both in projects he chooses, how he handles himself, how he knows how to act with the camera. Like you and I have talked about this multiple times. I think we've even talked about the podcast about how like cameramen or people, production people will watch him act. Well, I have that story the, like on set. Yeah. My, my cinematography, yeah, well, it. yeah, my cinematography professor in film school, he, um, he had a buddy, I think friend that was, uh, I believe a gaffer on 12 monkeys. Mm-hmm. And he told this story in film school to us that the, that his buddy that was the gaffer didn't think real highly going into the production of Brad Pitt, just thought he was a pretty boy. Didn't understand why they were casting him in this role opposite Bruce Willis. And they shoot the first day, whatever Pitt's first day of footage was, they was on film they shoot it. The gaffer doesn't really think anything of it, of the performance. It's like, nah, whatever. And then they sit in dailies the next, the next day after the film's been processed and they go, it comes to Pitt's footage and the guy's blown away mm-hmm. because he was yeah. doing things that only the film camera was picking up. Mm-hmm. It wasn't, if you were even standing 20 feet away on set watching, you wouldn't be able to catch the nuance that Pitt was delivering yeah. that only this film camera is picking up. And then that was when his opinion completely changed. And he knew Pitt was not just a pretty face, but a tremendous actor, like really, really yeah. good. He's definitely worthy of being a movie star. In my opinion, probably like one of the, one of the few like up there for me in best actors of all time. Like, and that's weird to say because he is such that pretty boy face and he's done that, you know, done those movies, but he's so absolutely amazing, but he's great in oceans 11 and going back to Clooney. I need to say this because I think it's one of the funniest lines if you kind of know it, but when George Clooney's at the poker table and Brad Pitt walks back in, and George Clooney is talking to Topher Grace and he just says, you know, was the transition easy from TV to film? You know, he asked that question and then Topher's like, like, not for me, dude. And it's like so funny because obviously that's what Clooney did because he had done ER. Well, he'd done ER and ER yeah. because he did both the sitcom and the drama. But, right. You know, that's fun. Uh, but like, I just think that line is so hilarious. But again, if you don't know his career trajectory, right. you, it's, you, you lose it. But oh, and this there's. This it's some like there's the lines in this are so good. You know, Topher talking to Brad Pitt about, hey, are you incorporated? You know, do you have an LLC? I'll pay you by check. And he's like, he's, or I or or I can just pay you by cash, you know. Um, and listening to the commentary, they said it was a, it was very hilarious to come out of that poker scene and George Clooney and Brad Pitt walk out and like no one mobs them, but then people mob like Topher yes. and <laughs> yeah. uh, Josh and stuff like that. They're like, this is just the best thing ever. Yeah. Soderbergh has uh, some amazing shots in this film. Like, I mean, it's not an epic. It's not one of those beautiful landscape stuff. But the shots that he gets, like one of my favorite shots is just simply right after basically Clooney gets out of jail when he's like they cut quickly to the that water shot going into Atlantic mm-hmm, City. Yeah. And the next shot is him coming up the escalator. And it's just I mean, it's just taking for what it is. It's not beautiful on its own, but there's something about the framing and the way it works. It just is a great, like it gets me every time. It's a masterclass in cinematography. Um, the fact mm-hmm. that he Soderbergh's such an auteur and the fact that he DP'd this under an alias, I believe, um, yeah. is just wild. I mean, just wild, but mm-hmm. he, he was kind of the self-made guy in the independent world where he shot a bunch of his own stuff. Um, mm-hmm. So it makes sense that, well, it doesn't really make sense on a studio picture like this that he wouldn't have just hired a cinematographer. But there must have been a complexity level to it that he just felt like this is what we need to do. But it's a lot mm-hmm. of handheld. You can tell he's not got a gigantic camera rig. It's whatever the smallest 35 millimeter camera, which is still pretty heavy. But there's a lot of handheld in this movie that it's really, mm-hmm. really good handheld footage. And yeah, it's a masterwork in framing. You're talking about the the escalator shot. Um, Mm -hmm. he does a similar kind of inverted setup with, with Tess coming down the Mm -hmm. stairs stairs. Mm -hmm. Um, my favorite moment in the movie is near the end after they've pulled off the heist and he does a beautiful homage to a wonderful scene from the right stuff. Mm, And in fact, it uses the same, it's Claire de Lune, the song, So Mm -hmm. in the right stuff, it's when they've all been kind of, they're in Texas being basically paraded around 
um, by Lyndon Johnson and they're mm-hmm. sitting and there's a, a performance done this gal kind of dancing with like the, this giant feather in front of her and stuff. And that song Claire de Lune's playing and they all look, mm-hmm. they're all looking at each other, kind of acknowledging like how incredible it is that they're, they've been selected to be America's astronauts. And Soderbergh does this wonderful homage to it where they all look at each other at the, the Bellagio fountain at the fountain and the same song yeah. plays in the background. And when I saw it in theaters, I knew I was like, wait, I, this, this all feels so familiar. And those there's theft. There's like film theft, which, which is just shoddy. Anyway. And why did yeah. you do that? And then there's, then there's the homage. And that mm-hmm. is one of the best homages I've ever seen in cinema yeah. because it's well, just, it's just as good as the right stuff and it makes perfect sense. And then, and the music makes sense and the visual makes sense and the way they look at each other and they slowly one, you know, one leaves. I forget who the last guy standing Carl is. Reiner. Is it Reiner? It's Reiner. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful, wonderful moment in wonderful moment in the movie and a wonderful moment in cinema. The homage works because it works. The scene works by itself. You don't need to have watched the right stuff no. to really get the the effect and the power of that scene. Right. If you have, obviously, then you're kind of like, wow, like this, like, like, oh, I see what he's done. This is fantastic. It adds a whole other layer, but by itself. And most of that scene was the only direction they got were stare at the fountain and Carl Reiner has to be the last person to leave. The rest of you just leave when you feel comfortable. So it's a very much kind of an organic scene of just – they, you know, all the actors and their characters of like, how long would I actually watch this? I've just completed this job and then leave. But even going back, so you talk about the beauty of this shot, even the shot that leads up to this, them walking out of the warehouse is absolutely beautiful framed of they go from complete darkness. And then as a group, they just kind of walk out. Laura and I were talking about this and she was just saying, as we we're watching it, she was just like, oh, that's a beautiful shot of just them walking out of the, out of the warehouse to go to the Bellagio fountain. And it's just this, just the framing, the lighting, like he thought of it all. Like he has done a masterful job with this. Yeah. He does a really nice job of using a lot of unconventional, uh, lighting color temperatures. It, mm-hmm. So that shot that you referenced that, that you and Laura really liked of them exiting the, the warehouse, they, if yeah. I'm not mistaken, they walk out into like that, almost like an, amber brown sodium mm-hmm. vapor yes, lighting. They do. Most filmmakers hate sodium vapor light, right? Cause it's, it's got one color temperature. It's that kind of brown golden. It's, it's not mm-hmm. typically light you want to shoot in. You, you'll see outdoor sequences under street lamps. Usually in movies, they replace those with, with like a full color spectrum bulb so that you're not getting cast in a pool of basically brown light. But in mm-hmm. that movie, in that sh- shot, it works. It's, it works. It looks great because he's got all the nice contrast. It's very, it's almost, you know, kind of high contrast film noir kind of, of a look. And yeah. I'll give it to Soderbergh. He really brings out the best in Las Vegas in this movie. And the key to shooting Vegas is to shoot it at night. Yep. Vegas, yeah. Vegas looks tremendous at night. It, terrible. It day. looks like absolute <laughs> trash in the day. Yeah. Just like Los Angeles. I love how he doesn't hold your hand in this movie. Like it's very little setup and then it just moves. Like, again, it's the brief little moment with the parole, parole board where, which was also great because he went back and re-edited it because at first it was supposed to be kind of that typical back and forth of shot of his face and then shot of the parole boards and there was a longer conversation and then him and the editor were in there and they're like, this is not working. It needs to be picked up. So they cut some things and then he just did that one shot on Clooney the entire time. And the only edit is when they asked him, like when the parole board goes, well, if you were released, what do you do next? And it cuts to him and then they cut, they, they ended up, he actually was supposed to answer that question, but then they cut it and then it just goes on to that. And I was like, Watching this film, there's this great balance of there's a lot of fast cuts or fast moving pace stuff. But right before it, he kind of sets himself, lets the viewer kind of get settled and then kind of gets you prepared to move. Like he does it like with that scene where it's you're sitting like getting prepared, like, oh, I'm watching a movie. I'm watching Clooney. And then it cuts to his face. And then it cuts to the, the, the flyer of the Atlantic City, Ocean's Eleven, people's names, and then him going up and then a bunch of fast cuts. And then it goes you know, onward 
And then you get you slow down a little bit when they're talking with Elliot Gould at his house, you know, where it's a lot of, you know, medium shots, a lot of a uh, little bit slower. And then at the end where they're walking away from him, they kind of just hold and let the actors move about the scene. But the camera doesn't actually change. It just sits there and lets them, you know, you have Clooney and Brad Pitt on the wings and you have Ellie Golden Miller walking towards them. But that scene actually just sits there. The camera doesn't change. Right. It's like one take. And then – it ends with Elliot Gould asking, saying, who do you have in mind? And then it cuts again. It's smash cuts. Those are, yeah, sma- those are smash cuts. Those are smash cuts. Yeah. But it, it's like he does the same thing. Like he doesn't let the characters answer and just lets no. the next scene yeah. answer the questions, which I think is like, it, it's so much fun. It's, it's so, it's so brilliant. high level editing. And yeah. it, it's obviously a collaboration between Soderbergh and then the editors, editors, Stephen, Mirione and okay it's really cool because like his third film that he edited was swingers oh that's right. in 96 oh, yeah, yeah. yeah and then uh you know he edits traffic swingers. and oceans 11 and then uh he's a very talented editor and apparently mm-hmm. Clooney must like him too because he had him edit good night and good luck um mm-hmm. but he's All right, he's in eyes of march birdman monuments men the revenant so just high, high level editor. He has won an Oscar. Good. Good. Um, let's see. Traffic. White. Won it for traffic. traffic yeah. yeah. Which is Soderbergh's so, best movie. Um, in my opinion. Yeah. I, no. I, I obviously <laughs> like traffic is, yeah, traffic is for this. It, you have to root really for this. Good. Uh, this is my favorite. This yeah, is my favorite. Your, no, it's down. fine. I, I think traffic's yeah, uh, his best movie. Um, yeah, I could, I could maybe say it's his best movie. I don't know. Like, I don't even, I don't even think, think I can say it. I mean, I, this is obviously my favorite over traffic, but this may, I may feel this is his best, most complete movie. Like traffic obviously is a different feeling movie, mm-hmm. but, um, but going back, like he doesn't let the, he doesn't explain a lot of things. He just lets the, the, again, kind of like this ride, like he's not stopping to kind of explain. And I love some of the, the, the stuff that he adds, like when Brad Pitt and Clooney are like in the office and they've just taken the plans of all the, the things and they're talking and he's just like, we're going to need a Jim Brown. We're going to need yeah, a broski. Yeah. We're going to need two Leon Sphinx and the biggest, like, like that's all made up stuff. Like none of that is like anything relative, but like, they don't explain it. They're not talking. You're just like, as the viewer, you're just supposed to go along with it and be like, okay, these are what these are. Yeah. Or if you don't get it, it doesn't matter. It's not part of the part of the plot, but he doesn't get bogged down in trying to like, here's the joke or here's the, no. you know, here's what I'm trying to do. He's just like, it, either you get it or you don't, you know, or you understand it or you don't doesn't matter. I just, We're just gonna I love on. that shot at the bar where he's, they're talking about who they need. And you, you think we, you <laughs> think like, we need one more, don't you? <laughs> All right, we'll get one more. We, we'll get one more. And yeah. it's just exhausted. Just laying across the bar. Yeah. But again, but so, but going back to the editing and going back to the camera work, I mean, think about it. You've just had this constant, you know, quick edits and shots of going around. And then now you have this bar scene where it's one camera shot just sitting there for a little bit to kind of slow, not slow things down, but give the viewer a chance to be able to like, okay, rest. And then we go to Chicago with a lot more, you know, with him talking with them, which is not as fast paced as previously, but it's kind of this, that bar scene is kind of this, Okay, we're gonna slow things down just for a little bit for you to catch your breath, and then we're then we're back on. I'm with you that this is pretty much flaw free. Like this yeah. is not a movie I'd pick apart. It's it's not. And and, and, and Soderbergh's music choices for this well, movie. Well, and that's kind of where my where I get a criticism of him, not for this film, but for the follow ups. Okay. Because in, especially That's in Ocean's good. 12, he just gets a little bit too carried away with with attempting. I think he was experimenting mm. with attempting to let scenes just play with music running underneath them and no dialogue. Oh, yeah, yeah. And he and they go for way too long. And they just felt bloated. But no, I agree with you. The music it's been a little bit since I've seen it, but the music is excellent. So, I love when you speaking of the music, I, I love when Ellie Gould is talking about the three top most successful Vegas, you know, 
thefts or mm-hmm. whatever, or, oh, yeah. you know, steals. And, and, and you go through and he's like, the number one is outside of Caesars in the eighties and, the, and they're playing take my breath away. And I was just like, he came, they, they, he, you know, they came, they, they saw, they conquered or whatever. And I was like, this is amazing. Just, Oh, like, Oh, there's this movie. I love this. I, love I this feel movie. like this ushered in a whole style of cinema mm-hmm. in the, in the two thousands with the quicker cuts almost. And it's not, it's not hyper cutting. It's not the editing style that I have complaints with, like where, which started in the born supremacy with green grass, with the really shaky cam constantly change, like changing camera angles every two seconds. It's not that style. So it's not even, I don't even call it the MTV, you know, music video edit style. Cause it's not, but there's way less setup from scene to scene. Like you said, it's, it's, Mm -hmm. it's a smash edit if they can get away with it to bring you to a totally different location and a different scene, but the narrative isn't lost. No. Whereas in an older film, you'd get a whole nother establishing shot. Like if they were going, if they were going from Atlantic city to, to, um, to LA you in this, I think you get a smash cut, but in, in an older film, you would, you'd get an airplane flying and then yeah. a big overhead shot of downtown Los Angeles. And then you'd get another shot of his house and then you'd be into the scene. Soderbergh's pretty, pretty revolutionary in his shot style and, and the edit and his pacing. And it's, it still feels really hip. I mean, this movie, mm-hmm. this movie is over 20 years old. And it still feels very, very modern. Yeah, it does. There's not, there's not a whole lot that feels particularly dated in it. I I suppose computers and cell phones and things like that. But as far as the style in which it's made from the lighting and cause he shot with a lot of available lighting too. There's scenes in this that aren't heavily lit and no, and it has a more of a run and gun feel. It's kind of, there's elements that have of, of a guerrilla filmmaking kind of feel, especially when he gets out of prison. It's just this walking over the shoulder of Clooney. Yeah. It's not anything. It's not on a steady cam. It's not on a dolly. It's, it's literally it's handheld. You can tell that works in this cause it keeps it frenetic, but there are places where this thing's super polished. And they did a lot of shooting actually at the Bellagio. They were allowed to shoot in the Bellagio. Yeah. Um, and they stayed in the Bellagio too, which to uh, the discredit of a lot of the actors on their downtime, they gambled a lot <laughs> at, in between doing their <laughs> shot, shoot scenes. So like apparently like Clooney was down like 25K or something like that by the end of the shoot <laughs> to to the Bellagio. Amazing. So fun fact, uh, Soderbergh actually wanted the cast to kind of really bond. And so like he kind of had them all come to set pretty much all days, even if they weren't supposed to be there. But he goes, it kind of defeat what well, like it works, but also somewhat defeated the purpose because they all stood around Carl Reiner and listened to Carl Reiner yeah. tell stories like like that. That was their day was just Carl Reiner just regaling them with stories. Well, and Reiner's just, Reiner's my favorite. Saul's my favorite character in the whole movie. Oh, just it's, <laughs> if you ask me that question again, Daniel, <laughs> you will not wake up the following morning. <laughs> I saw you at the paddock. Yeah, <laughs> I saw you before you even got up this morning. The I'm script, sorry. like, like it's, just, I, it's like again, it's so quick, it's so good. There's so many good points, and I love the fact that they don't try to translate Yen. They just respond to Yen, mm-hmm. like he just speaks Chinese, and they're just like, oh yeah, well, whatever. That's what it is. Like it, it just he doesn't slow down for anything. It's just this constant, like, nope, we're moving, we're going. And this, this is oh. another film that's got one we've lost, which is Bernie Mac. Bernie Mac. Mm-hmm. as Catton and he was he was great he was great and I love that I love that scene with him and Damon <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Damon's supposed to be from like the review board the or NGC. something like that and he's yeah. like supposed to, and he's basically what it, he's basically racist he's just always yeah. throwing out those yeah <laughs> yeah I don't even know if he could get away with uh, that now or when when Bernie Mac is getting the vans and he's like, and then he's like, you know, grabs the guy's hand. He's like, do you, do you moisturize? moisturize? <laughs> <laughs> I went fragrance free for a whole year. <laughs> and I, I think that's, I'd be, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's improvised. Oh, that's, I'm pretty sure it's oh, all improvised. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. 
this goes back to what we uh, talked about with because this isn't this is a hybrid film, right? This this is a heist mm-hmm. heist comedy with some pretty frankly some pretty good action to it too. Yeah. yeah. And but this follows the rule, one of the my kind of unwritten rules of comedy, which is to allow your your folks to improvise. Yeah, you just give them a framework and let them let them go. They know where the, they know where these characters are doing and where where they're going. So yeah, that stuff. I mean, and we've gotten this far without even talking about Don Cheadle. As, oh as yeah, Bash. like again, who He's just going Barney. Pro- trouble? <laughs> what trouble? <laughs> trouble. <laughs> Or like, I, I love the fact when he's about to set off, set off the, um, yes, uh, the, not the bomb, but he grabs his junk to protect him. Oh, like, yeah. What the heck? The EMP. Yeah, the oh, EMP. this is, I mean, or like, or where he's watching the, de- the demolition of the building on TV and it's literally happening right behind him. Like that's the little fun things that you just, you know, I don't know how that comes up, but that's just, it's just brilliant, you know? Or I love the fact like when Brad Pitt breaks him out of the cop stuff, he says, you know, booby traps aren't, you know, Mr. You know, Mr. Bash's style. But then he just goes, do you check his person for booby yeah. traps? It's like yeah. he's going so fast and he's just, oh. The humor in this script is really smart. It's a really smart script. Yeah, very smart film. Like you said, this is not a spoon fed movie, but it's done in such a high level way that I don't recall people coming out of this confused on what had happened. And I think a lot of it too is also like k- kind of, you know, what, what we've already talked about. We're like with the fountain scene, like there's a lot of high level stuff. If you've watched a lot of cinema, if you are into this, you're going to get more out of it. But if you haven't, you're still going to get something out of it, you know, or like the line, the, the Boski, the Jim Brown to Leon Sphinx is like, again, he's just rounding stuff off. You get what he's talking about, but you know, it's fun, like finding out that those are absolutely meaningless and have nothing to do with anything is just kind of a fun little like not of like this is just the crazy stuff that they come up with on set. If some, someone thought this up, just rewatching it just made me want to rewatch it again. Like I don't even want to watch 12 and 13. I'm totally OK not seeing this. I'm totally OK with this being just by itself and just being a one off. Yeah. And it probably should have been a standalone in retrospect, mm-hmm. maybe. But I know the sequels did very well. I get and a lot of people love them too. Yeah. So yeah, and they're not bad. They're not bad films. They just never quite get to this level. He just set the bar so high. He did. Yeah. What a blast. He did. What a fun movie. And uh, Andy Garcia just killer in the role. I mean, My so close good. Personal friend, yeah. Andy, Car- Andy Garcia. Yeah. You ran into him right in the store. I did in the in the grocery store. Yeah. And yeah. you you didn't you walk yeah. up to him and tell him like. No, no. No. So. So I was walking past him and I mean, this is when we were living in LA yeah. and you see obviously a lot of yeah, famous people sure. in LA. And so I walk, walked past and I'm like scanning the aisle and I see him and I'm like, Oh, that's Andy Garcia. And then I walk, like I kind of do a double quick double take, but then I walk past, I don't say anything to him. Cause I'm like, he's out grocery shopping. I don't want to be that jerk. And, and, and he turns, he goes, yeah, it's me. And I like, and so I turn, I'm like, <laughs> Mr. Garcia, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to like, you know, break you out. And he's like, no, no, not a problem or whatever. And so we talked for like a couple moments or whatever. And I was, you know, it's like, you're great and untouchables really loved you in oceans 11. Like I really appreciate your work, you know, all that stuff. He was really nice. Yeah. Like to me, I mean, for, for me just doing a quick double take, like he gave me the time of day. It's not like I was like, That's hey, cool. can I have your autograph yeah. or like going up. But like, I think maybe it was because I wasn't approaching him. I was trying to give him a space that he was. Yeah cooler with it but yeah like he's my close personal friend so. <laughs> a close personal friend yeah. of the podcast andy garcia, <laughs> andy garcia. <laughs> oh man i'm gonna tell you my my last final thoughts on this movie was every time i watch this and I, for the longest time i want to wear more suits mm. I, every time i watch this i i always want to like brad pitt and clooney just look so good in their suits and i'm like maybe i should wear more suits and then i'm like no, it's really warm outside. Yeah. I don't want to wear suits. No, I'm, I want to see it again. And what I want to do the next time you're back here in my neighborhood is put on the screen. Yeah, but we need to get, we need to get a Blu-ray of it or something. So it's higher, higher quality. Yeah. So it's not standard def. Yeah. and screen it, screen it and give yeah, you, give do. you something approximating the theatrical the feel, the feel. Yeah. Cause that That'd does, that makes me sad that it's like in your yeah. top top floating in your top five and you weren't able to see it in a theater. So, yeah. Well, I mean, obviously he's my number one movie. And I 
still have yet to see it in the theater. That's true. There's so. a couple in my top 10 that, that I never got the theatrical yeah. on. So hopefully they would just, yeah. I don't know, This longer this strike goes on, the more these theaters need to think about re-releasing stuff. Just start Yep. Start in the 70s or 60s or whatever and start, and start moving let's up. start moving up. But, well, we appreciate everybody tuning in to Cinema A to B. Go ahead yeah. and uh, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell if you liked what you heard and we put them out every monday thanks to our audio only podcast listeners we appreciate you and uh, very much yeah we will uh sign off and jump back on here uh next week with another episode which i'm not sure what that's going to be there's some options but there are many options but yeah all right everybody thanks everybody